there, it's Gabrielle Nicolay from Speech Kids and Raising Orchid Kids, where we teach little kids to talk and help parents understand their kids. And today I am super excited and delighted to be with Carice Laguerre. Carice, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I am so honored. I'm going to let you do the honors and tell the good people what you do and who you do it with and all the good things. I am a registered dental hygienist by licensure and initial training, but now I don't do any clinical dental hygiene. Now I am a myofunctional therapist. Um, so full-time in my private practice, the myo spot, I see people of all ages all across the country and the globe really to help them get over all sorts of breathing and oral dysfunction issues that they may have. I'm sure we'll dive in more that way. That makes sense. We are definitely going to dive in more because you said a big word, which was myofunctional. Yes. So let's break it down. What does that mean, please? Okay. So the functional part, I feel I, I hope a good portion of people understand the myo part, M-Y-O, it's muscle. It's like a medical terminology that we would use for muscle. So muscle function and we we work on that specifically in the oral facial region so I like to say that I work with all the muscles below the eyes but above the shoulders so like think about this range and we're good good one oh I like that (laughs) below the eyes above the shoulders okay and why if I let's let's go big picture here I'm trying to think if that's what I want to do we're going to do it (laughs) yes because I'm a speech therapist by training and a parent coach. So if I don't have a speech and language disorder, Mm -hmm. if I don't have a feeding disorder, Mm -hmm. those are the two buckets that I tend to think of and that the people I work with tend to think of. Why do I need oral myofunctional therapy? Any number of reasons. So it can affect, there are a myriad of ways in which it manifests. Mm -hmm. So it could be a behavioral issue that you might be seeing that you don't link to, you know, breathing and how you are functioning. Um, It could be a developmental um, issue that you are not growing in the skull, in the the teeth or the face. It's not growing optimally. Mm. You might have a deviated septum. You might have some things going on around all of these bones that support that upper respiratory tract that we really, Mm. really need. Super, super important Mm -hmm. that could be affecting too. Okay, um, stop because you already mentioned behavior and breathing. Yeah. And you just got through saying how you deal with anything below the eyes and on, on top of the shoulders. We got to yeah. back up. I'm realizing okay. we got to talk about breathing. What's the deal with breathing? I, I don't know. It's just super important. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I tend to okay, do it wait, all the time. Because people think, but hold on a second, right? Because, <laughs> you know, being facetious, right? People think breathing is breathing is breathing and that this kind of breathing is the same as this kind of breathing. Not true. No. Okay. So how you breathe matters. It's very, very important. We're supposed to breathe through our nose. Our upper respiratory tract needs to be nice and open and clear to accept all of this. Our nose is the number one gift that we've been all blessed with in order to optimize that oxygen, right? So we can go for a couple of weeks without food. We can go for a few days, maybe without water, but not any of us can really last but a few minutes without air. So we have to make sure that we're getting one air. We have to breathe, but how we get that in matters. So through our nose, what we're going to get is the air warmed and humidified and filtered. Why does that matter? We need filtered air. We're trying to protect ourselves, especially now that we've gone through this respiratory pandemic that we've all been through, right? We know that that was a respiratory disease. So now we really know we have to filter naturally as much as we can, the things that are in the air quality around us. So we want that to come through our nose. There is no filtration system through the mouth, right? And then we're going to get it to be nice and warmed so that it's really acceptable for our bodies, which are generally warm. We are warm-blooded animals. We're creatured. <laughs> okay. We're designed for this. Yeah. And we want it to be um, 
preparing our body to accept because we want this oxygen to bond to the hemoglobin, right? So how, or bond to become the hemoglobin. So how are we going to get that there? It's a lot of that nitric oxide that's developed then processed in the nose. Like we don't get that production anywhere else. It's not the same quality of air when you're breathing through your mouth. And so we've got to make sure that we're breathing appropriately because you can breathe wrong. Yeah. Lots of people do actually. Um, and there's some really interesting research, uh, number one, about like the health detriments to mouth breathing mm. and the health benefits to nose breathing. Okay. So that's one thing, but we've got a whole generation of kids. And in fact, mouths have been getting airways have been getting smaller mm. since about what, 1700, since the modern diet and all of this stuff took effect. Right. So our faces are getting smaller. Our palates are getting narrower because we're not using our teeth because our children are eating applesauce out yeah. of pouches. Stinking pouches. And so now we've got, we not only have a functional issue, sometimes we have a structural oh, issue and we're kind of all over the map here, but um, that's okay. We're, we're jumping around kind of on purpose to show just the breadth of what you as a myofunctional therapist are thinking about. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. So tell us a little bit about structure for a second. Okay. So structure, incredibly important because you were talking about the palate and just for anybody who may be unsure, the palate is the roof of the mouth. Mm -hmm. And so if you're thinking about the roof of your mouth, you have to understand that structurally, if we're looking at a skull, let's just take a skull that we can all picture in our minds. There's that bone, which is yes, the roof of the mouth, but it's also the floor of the nose. So if you have a narrow roof of your mouth, that must mean that you have a narrow floor of your nose. So what does that mean for your ability to breathe adequately, right? And then we're going to look at the other areas. So that's like the upper part of the upper respiratory system and tract. Then we're going to come down a little bit, okay? So now if you are looking at your mouth and the palate, the roof is narrow and you're looking at the bottom and the bottom is narrow too, it might even be pushed back a little bit. That's going to impact the front and the side borders of that upper respiratory system because Again, if we think about that skull, if we push back that lower arch of teeth, that lower jaw on a skull, suddenly now we don't have as much room around where that upper respiratory tract would be. And so it's incredibly important that one, you're able to physiologically nasal breathe, but two, that if that structure is limiting, that you're working on getting it to be as functionally wide as it can be. Okay. And sometimes that involves working with an orthodontist mm -hmm. or a dentist. Yeah. Who knows? Or an oral surgeon. It can go a number of ways. Okay. Yeah. And depending on, so this is better done. Side, side note, early intervention also applies here. Yes, <laughs> right? children are so malleable. Mm -hmm. They are resilient and because they have a lot of growth potential, you're able to make things change. So you can change the trajectory of what's coming in the future. Whereas us adults, man, <laughs> when we discover something, we're like, ah, I wish I knew this earlier, right? Right, yeah. And then we're doing years of Invisalign and all kinds of other things. Yeah, there's fancy, fancy devices for adults out there. Um, my husband is actually doing one of them. It's a homeo block. Um, yeah, so he's... Anyway, long story short, he's got a major tongue tie. He's working with a dentist, a myofunctional dentist to expand his palate, make room in the roof of his mouth for his tongue. And eventually he'll get a, a tongue tie release. I love it. I know he's very excited, but okay. And the part of the reason I bring that up is because every case is different. Yeah. Absolutely. Every single case is going to vary. So I don't know if you want to like give us a, for instance, obviously you won't tell us who it is, but like, give us a, give us an interesting case or yeah. give us a list of like, what are you thinking about when somebody comes to you and says, first of all, what do they even say? Why do people call you? <laughs> I, I, there are a lot of reasons why people call me. Um, I would say just for an example, just to go back to 
your husband and how mm. you stated that he has a tongue tie, but he's doing the homeo block first and he's working with his structure to try to get that widened, right? Mm-hmm. Before he does his tongue tie release, there's a lot of factors to kind of be put into place. So sometimes people might contact me and say, you know, I have sleep apnea, I've been using a CPAP, I have a tongue tie that my dentist told me about, I think we're going to release it. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa pump the brakes, hold on. There's an order of operations that we have to follow. Okay. So when we're looking at that kind of stuff, we don't want to make anything worse. And so we would never want to release the tongue. If you imagine it like a wild beast, we would never want to release the tongue in an area of which it can't thrive, right? So our tongue has to have space. That way it can be up and out of the airway. And when that Space is not available in its little home, right? The cage that would be our teeth. If they're too narrow, those arches and so forth, and the tongue can't fit, it just falls back, right? Mm-hmm. So it falls backwards. And we don't want the tongue falling backwards or hiding back there. And so if you think about releasing that tongue or giving more tongue freedom to fall even further back, sometimes it makes things so much worse, so much worse. And then you're not able to, you know, really get it to be better. And so there's a lot of things that kind of go into play. So yes, the structure and the tongue ties, um, people may contact me with just the sleep apnea issue. And sometimes I I like this lovely little um, analogy where I say, if you imagine somebody who is like a bodybuilder and they have six pack abs and they go to lie down at night, those six pack abs are there, they are tight, they're strong, you know, even though they've lied down, they don't look any different, that person. Now you take somebody with a beer belly and you lie them down and everything just kind of shifts. That belly doesn't look quite the same as it did when they were standing up, right? And so that's kind of a little bit of how we would think about our our, our peripheral space. (laughs) Yes, when you have these muscles that are just sort of, you know, beer belly-like and you lie (laughs) down, and everything with gravity, it starts to pull down. And then our first stages of sleep are all those muscles relaxing anyway. We get like a beer belly airway. Mm, yeah. That's so super it funny. Down on itself. Yeah. And then you wake yourself up and then you're not sleeping well. And then you have a mood disorder because you're not sleeping well. Yes. That's okay. super interesting to me. This, this link between, and you alluded to it interest, uh, earlier, which was, behavior, sleep, breathing, right? So behavior can calm parts, certain like bad behavior. We're talking about like even maybe ADHD. Oh, definitely. Comes from a, a lack of quality sleep, enough of the right kinds of sleep, perhaps, right? Yes. Maybe brains are already dysregulated. Okay. Maybe all this is correlative and not causative. Okay. You know, I don't want anybody hauling me in, but let's just call it. There's a link, right? Between these like behavioral academic disturbances, say quality sleep and quality sleep to breathing. Yes. Absolutely. There's a big, big correlation. Can you give us an, sorry, go ahead. Even just if you think about, because I think you're going to ask me for an example, right? Let's talk about another analogy. I love analogies. They're my thing, right? Perfect. They're very good for teaching, by the way. (laughs) They are. They are. When you have somebody who is sleep deprived as an adult, let's take an adult. We'll we'll go back to the children just to talk about how it impacts us. That Mm -hmm. way we can really get the connection. You take somebody who is very sleep deprived as an adult and they, they have a sort of brain fog. They're unable to really put together sentences well. Their balance is definitely going to be off. When you are very tired, you're just kind of a shell of yourself. You've almost got what can be likened to being intoxicated right so you've got like a drunken sort of mind even though you may not have had any sort of you may not have imbibed anything okay Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we take a child that is sleep deprived and a child who maybe has not gotten an adequate uh, cycling through these important stages stage three of sleep where we're getting the human growth hormone that's secreting so that's their growth 
the REM, where the brain is really inputting memories. And that's how they're retaining a lot of information that they're learning throughout their day. Mm -hmm. The brain is actually detoxifying itself during mm -hmm. that. And we're getting a lot of good quality things done. When that's not happening for children and they're sleep deprived, they're not tiny adults in the fullest sense. They have their own sort of reactions. And a lot of these line up very closely with ADHD-like ADHD. symptoms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the important thing to remember is that ADHD, very real, very important that we get a diagnosis, but the diagnosis is not something that you get a blood test for, you take any sort of you know, diagnostic procedure for, it's really symptom-based. And so if we're looking at those symptoms, it's important to get a differential to say, okay, well, what else could this possibly be that we might be able to directly assess, diagnose, or treat? Yeah. Yeah. And so, okay, let's do this for a second. Because when parents come to me for a speech and language issue or a behavioral issue, they're often coming for that as well. One of the things I ask them is about um, is about sleep. How much, how much sleep do they get? And then I usually ask something like, are they a noisy sleeper or a quiet sleeper? I'm not sure that that's going far enough, but so what, what would you say to parents who like want to understand, okay, well, is my child sleeping well? Like, how would I know this other than the back end? Does that make sense what I'm asking you? Absolutely. Because a lot of people don't know. We don't do co-sleeping in the same way. And it's not as societally encouraged as it used to be maybe, you know, 30, 40 years ago. So now everybody's in different rooms. You have no idea how your child sleeps. And we turn off those baby monitors as fast as we can, right? <laughs> So we don't, yes, have, please. <laughs> yeah, we don't have three-year-olds still sleeping with the baby monitors, right? So you don't know how your child is sleeping. And so that is a very important question. I think it's really good to, in the middle of the night, as, as you are able to go in, check on them, listen to them. Breathing is supposed to be inaudible. We don't want to hear breathing. Snoring, everybody says it's cute. In children, it's really not. It's the sound of air meeting resistance as it's going through the upper respiratory tract. And I've never thought about breathing in a way that's like, oh, it's so cute that my air is not getting through there well. No. It's not, it's not a cute thing. And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're listening. Are you hearing anything? If you're hearing the sounds of their teeth grinding together, sometimes people hear that too. They say, oh man, their jaw, it must hurt in the morning. They're just grinding away at night and you can hear it and you can hear it maybe from even outside the door. You don't want to hear any sounds. So keep track of any noises. You want to see if you can look at how they're postured. Are they sleeping with their chin elevated? Because that's a way of them manually keeping that airway open, right? They're keeping their chin elevated. Their head is tilted back. Their mouth might be agape. You don't want their mouth to be open. That's something to keep note of. Well, they're sleeping with their mouth open. Okay. And are they restless sleepers? Are they tossing and turning at night? Are they not really getting a rested sleep? They're just sort of unconscious for a little while because there's a difference. Yeah. There's a difference. Yeah. 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 Oh my God. So many questions. Okay, I'm gonna, I think do one more. Um, what, there's two things I wanted to say about this. One is in infants, I don't know if there are still cultures, there certainly used to be cultures where somebody was around to close the baby's mouth. Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. What do you know or have, what have you heard about that? And how, and, and should we, I'm not actually asking you, should we keep somebody awake with the baby at night? But like, what can people do when they're seeing their infant, for example? And I mean, you know, we're not going to do this to a five-year-old, but like an infant who is open, what can we be doing about that? So a really great thing to do, if you're finding that they're open, that means that their tongue isn't connected to the roof of their mouth either. So that tongue, we still want up and connected to that palate. One, because we talk about all that developmental stuff. And so that's going to help really act as a scaffold and help them as they're growing and developing because we get so much growth in the first year of life. We want that to be optimal. We want that tongue to be up there. Okay, that start. Way. sorry, pause. <laughs> yeah. We didn't talk about this explicitly, which is tongue should be, you did, but I'm going to repeat. Tongue should be resting in the roof of the mouth. Right. And there should be enough room for the tongue to do so. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And tongue is also shaping, particularly early on, shaping the palate 
if it's resting up there. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Just wanted to like, Absolutely. <laughs> so and now I completely interrupted you. Go ahead. No, that's incredibly important because with that importance of the tongue and where the tongue is sitting, it's not enough to just have somebody come and push the jaw closed or close the lips. We want to actually get underneath that jaw too, because you can mm -hmm. feel the tongue and you can gently push that up as well. So now the jaw is going closed and the tongue is going up. And if you hold there for just about a second or two, pull your hand away slowly, they should retain that posture. If they are having difficulty, let's remember that we can't rule out that babies may have some structural inability to nasal breathe. And so we don't want to make life any harder for them because that just makes life harder for mom and dad. There'll be more crying, more sleeplessness and so forth. But if they're unable to hold that posture, try it again. And if they can't, uh, get your child assessed. For all my prompt therapists watching that, that's like a prompt cue right there. That's really interesting. Okay, right under the, yeah, you can access the tongue right on, right behind your chin bone. Yep. Right there. Oh my God, we could do this for another hour and I think we'll have you back. Um, <laughs> but I think we're going to leave it there for now. If people want, oh, you have written a book. I have. Tell I have. us about your book. I am so happy to share it. I talk about my life, my stories with my children and how I really dove into a lot of this because it's so important to catch it when it's early because, you know, sick children just, it compounds as you age into dysfunctional adults. And so and all the children are sick right now. Oh, so all many of the children, so many of them. Yep. Any so. playground in America that you walk around and you look and the, it's there, it's all there. Yeah. So uh, my book is called Accomplished, How to Sleep Better, Eliminate Burnout and Execute Goals. You'll get a full four-step plan as to how you can really naturally go through developing your own better sleep schedule, airway management routine, and really honing in on how you can optimize as much of your breathing as possible to help you be your best, most productive self. Awesome. Love it. And if people want to get a hold of you, where do they do that? My website, I am at themyospot.com. Perfect. And you work with people, as you said, all over the world. Yes. Um, and so people can find you there. They will also be able to find you here next time you come. I hope you say yes. Yes, absolutely. I'll it's be back. Been such a pleasure, Carice. Thank you. Thank you.